Welcome. If you're just joining us, I'm Pastor John, and tonight we're continuing in the study of the Gospel of Mark. And so if you have your Bible, your your phone, or whatever it is you prefer to use, we're going to be in the first chapter of Mark. We we just began last week, and if you were with us last week, we talked about the human author, the the man named John Mark, the the man who penned this letter in its original form, um, what 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 we what we call now a, a book or a gospel. He wrote this, this history of the Lord Jesus Christ based upon the testimony of the Apostle Peter. Of course, over and above all that, we know that, that Mark's account of the gospel of Jesus Christ was, was, was guided or, or superintended by the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because this is what Jesus promised. You may remember in John chapter 14, verse 26, where Jesus said that the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. And so those were the words of Jesus to his disciples. And and we know that that Mark's gospel is based upon the eyewitness report of the apostle Peter, through whom Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would teach him and remind him of everything that he had said to him. These were the words that were written down by Mark, beginning in verse 1. Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verse 1 where he says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, the, the word gospel is very familiar to us, maybe, maybe too familiar, but, but because often we refer to the gospel and, and we think we're referring to the gospel of, of Matthew or the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke or the gospel of John. However, in the, in the New Testament, you may be surprised to know that the word gospel was never a reference to one of those four books. The the word gospel in the New Testament always referred to the message of salvation. And so, how are we to understand the context in which Mark is writing when he says the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ? 
You know, how is he using the word? How, how would his audience, his hearers in the first century, view its significance? Well, let's look at the Greek word translated gospel and, and see, what, see what this means. See what, it, see what it would mean to those who would read or hear this book in the first century. Well, first of all, you, you need to know this is a very old word and also a very familiar word. No matter who you were, whether a Jew or Gentile or believer or unbeliever, it, it was a, a well-known word. It's, and it, it's very specific in its meaning. The literal meaning of this word is, is good news, joyous message, or, or glad tidings. The best way to understand that would be to look at the, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament where we find this word. This is this would be the best way, you know, to, to look at the way something is translated is, is to go back and look at other places and other ways it is translated. The best example I, I could find is, or I think is in Isaiah chapter 40, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. Isaiah chapter 40. This, this is this is what, what God is telling his people through Isaiah from the perspective of of the near future, but also from the, the far off uh, perspective or the far off viewpoint of, of the coming of the Messiah, the coming Messiah. And so in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9 of following, Isaiah writes, you, you who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and he recom his recompense accompanies him. And so right here in, in verse 9, Isaiah says, you who bring good tidings, you who are a bearer of good news, or you who are a herald of good news. Go to the highest point to make the announcement so that you can be heard by the most people. That announcement, that, that message translated good tidings or good news is, is here is your God. It's, it's an announcement of the, of the coming of God, the coming of your king. The, he says the, the sovereign Lord comes with power. And so Isaiah is announcing the, the good news of the arrival of God. He's referring to the, to the, the rise or the ascent of God to rule. And this, this would have been the best news possible because he wrote this to people who were in captivity. They, these were those who were being held um, captive, but now they're being told that restoration is coming, that the punishment is over, and, and you're going to go back home, back to Jerusalem, and, and the Lord is going to rule over you. And so th this word gospel describes the very best news possible. It's the, it's the rise of a new king, the rise of a sovereign Lord to his throne over his people in, in, a, in a situation or a kingdom where there would be, be salvation, peace, and happiness. This is the way the Jews would have understood this word. But what, what about the non-believers? How, how would the Romans have understood this word? Well, there, there was an inscription, an engraving in ancient Rome that's dated from, from 9 BC, which, which uses the word gospel to describe the arrival of Caesar Augustus. And so the, the good news then was that Caesar Augustus had arrived, and, and this inscription was dedicated to him on his birthday, making reference to his triumphant rise to power as emperor. And so both Jews and unbelievers would understand that word as, as signifying the arrival of a new ruler, a lord or a king, bringing about a new era or order of order of, of peace and salvation. And so here, here in verse 1 of Mark's gospel, he, he chooses a word that is, is universally understood. No matter whether Jew or Gentile, believer or unbeliever, stating that, that he's about to write the history of a new king. This, this is the beginning of the good news. And he's about to tell the story of the rise of a new king who's far more glorious than all of the kings. He begins using language that would make this, his Roman readers know that this new king has come, that he set himself above all kings, and his name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, the, the name Jesus identifies our king in his humanity. 
You may remember that's, that's the name the angel told Joseph to name this child. Matthew tells us in chapter 1, verse 21, that the angel appeared to him in a dream and said, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And so his name is Jesus. But, but his title, you know, who he is, his title is Christ. That's, that's not his last name. It's a title. That, that he is the anointed one. That, that's what Messiah means. Christ and Messiah are the same thing. It means anointed one. And then of his lineage, Mark tells us, he is the son of God. In other words, he's one in nature with God. He's one with God. He's, he's eternally God. This is how we find him introduced in John's gospel as well. In, in John, John chapter 1, verse 49 when the disciple Nathanael was introduced to Jesus, he declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus is unlike any other king. He sets himself above all other kings. And he's the one whom the Bible calls the King of Kings. And so this book that Mark is writing here is about the arrival of of the greatest king ever, a new king introducing a new kingdom. This, this is a, a new era for the world. And Mark establishes what this book is about in his opening sentence, just that one sentence. And then in verse 2, he begins with, with two prophecies, two prophecies, I'm sorry, two prophecies attributed to Isaiah. He says in verse 2, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, if, if you were to try to look up these verses on Isaiah, you may, you may find yourself a little confused because verse two is actually a quote from Malachi chapter three, verse one. And it's verse three that is the quote from Isaiah in chapter 40, verse three. And that this wasn't an uncommon thing to do, but to, to refer to only one prophet, and that being the, the most prominent one, or the more notable one, the, the famous one. And then you just kind of slide the other prophecy in there to, to build upon it or confirm it, since all of it's the word of God anyway. So uh, here, here we see that Isaiah gets all the credit. Both of these prophecies go together perfectly, and both of them refer to the same person. And so they, they, they may have, in fact, been used together frequently. Here in Mark's Gospel, we find Malachi contains the introduction, but Isaiah overshadowing Malachi as, as being the, the most important one or the, or the prominent prophet. So Mark, Mark, he opens up his prophecy. He opens us up heralding the, the arrival of the king. But he doesn't do like Matthew or Luke do in their accounts, where they give specific prophecies about Jesus. You know, they, they talk about the, the virgin birth or um, Bethlehem or, or being called out of Egypt. Because Mark here is writing to the Gentiles. He, he knows that they wouldn't know all the, all the um, prophetic scriptures. He knows it's simply enough to say, that, that he's the son of God. And if you were to look at the story of this new king, you know, if they were looking at this, they, they would expect that there would be some, some kind of fanfare, some kind of, of credible herald announcing his arrival. Because that's exactly the way it was in the Roman world. That's the way they did it. The king always had a forerunner. There was an, an entourage, someone coming before him to prepare the way, you know, with, with trumpets and all that, and, and, and making the people ready. Mark knows this, and being consistent with Roman culture, recognizing how kings were announced, he refers to Old Testament prophesy, prophecy, I, I keep don't making that mistake, prophesy or prophecy, but he speaks about this herald, this, this messenger, to give authenticity to the proclamation of this coming king. Therefore, he labels this from Isaiah the prophet, a prophet whom even Gentile Christians would have known because of his extensive writing, much of that which is centered around the coming of the Messiah. And so we, the Gentile readers, 
would need to know that the, the one who announced Christ's arrival is the one foretold by the prophets, and most notably, by the prophet Isaiah. That would, that would be meaningful. Malachi, in his text in chapter 3, records the Lord saying in the first person, he says, my, my messenger will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come. Isaiah said, prepare the way for the Lord, make a highway or a super highway for, for our God. And so God is telling us through his prophets that the messenger is announcing my arrival and he goes before me. Now, of course, the, the world has never seen a king like this, but, but God himself will come to his people. God, the, the son, will be their new king. And so Mark says in verse 1, he, he says, this, this is the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the beginning. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This, this is the announcement, the heralding that God has come. The God of the universe has broken into history. His name is King Jesus. He is the Son of God. The new king is here bringing salvation, blessing, and peace to his people. And so it's a new day for the whole world. It's a new day for human history. This is the good news. And it's a lot of good news. It's plural. But there's only one good news. Right? There's only one good news. Because there, there's salvation and no one else. There, there's no other name by which we may be saved. Our king has come and his name is Jesus. He has sent his messenger ahead of him to prepare the way. And verse 4 tells us, And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, a literal translation begins, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. He appeared in the wilderness, which is the same word as, as, as desert, and he was identified by, by what he did, that thing that was distinguishing about him. This was, this was John the baptizer. Over the past few weeks, we, we've, we've heard the mention of the name of, of Mary in our, in our studies and, and on Sundays. And, and I've commented that it's, it's not this one or that one. And last week, we talked about, about Mary, the, the mother of John Mark. Sunday, we, we talked about Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And the, the week before Resurrection Sunday, we read about Mary Magdalene and, and Mary, the mother of James. And so when we read through the New Testament and you have the, the name Mary, whichever Mary it is, is, is identified by some other name. Because you've, you've got to have some way to identify what Mary you're talking about. And in the same way, you need some way to identify what John you're talking about, because John was a very common name in Hebrew. Just like in my family, I was, I was John the third. But, but my grandfather, his name was John, but he went by Wally. My, my father's was, name was John, but he went by, by Jack. And so I was the one who, who went by the name John. And so here in verse 4, the, the literal translation identifies John as the baptizer, because that was the, that one thing that set him apart from everybody else. In fact, nobody else did that. There, there wasn't a baptismal pool in the temple. The Jews had, had ceremonial cleansings and washings and all of that, but, but the, the basin of water there in the temple wasn't, wasn't for baptism. The, the only time they ever did a baptism was if there was a, a proselyte, a, a Gentile convert into Judaism. And when they, when they would go through a baptism and immersion in water to symbolize that that being purified from their former life and entering into the the, the purity of, of of Judaism, the purity of that religion, it also included circumcision. So, as you can imagine, it wasn't a very desirable thing. It wasn't a common thing. Pro, proselyte baptism was very unusual, and that's why why John could be identified as the baptizer. Verse 4 says that, that John came baptizing in the desert or in the wilderness, depending on your translation, and, and the biblical record identifies him about 25 to 30 miles south of the Sea of Galilee uh, along the Jordan River. And so it was up and down that river in the desert that, that John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
That's that's what he was doing. He was he was going before the arriving king, removing all the obstacles in his path, making straight paths for him so that the people were ready to receive this new king. And so it, it was their willingness to undergo a baptism, demonstrating their repentance, which would prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. The, the Christ would, would forgive their sins, but, but without faith, without faith, which leads to repentance, there, there is no forgiveness. It, it, it takes faith to, to repent. you got to have a motivator. you got to have something that drives you. And without faith, there is no forgiveness. And, and John's baptism didn't, didn't bring forgiveness of sin. It, it only declared that the one who was being baptized was prepared and intent upon receiving God's mercy. That, that's, that's why John was labeled the baptizer, because he was preparing the way for the new king, our Christ, our, our Savior, Jesus. Now, as, as we consider who John is, there's, there's so much that could be said. Each, each of the other gospel writers include wonderful stories about him. They, they tell about his miraculous conception, how he was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb, how he was a relative of Jesus, and, and how he was the last prophet, the culmination of Old Testament prophetic history. But, but we, we won't go into all that because Mark leaves that all out. He just says he's, he's the messenger. He, he's announcing the, the new king, and in verse 5, it says that the, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And so John's message was very simple. It was repent of your sins and be baptized. He was preparing the way and everybody was coming out to him. No, nobody wanted to be left out, but, but it, was, it, was a, it was a pretty big statement in that day to be baptized by John. Because like I mentioned, baptism was, was for proselytes to Judaism. And so to be baptized for a Jew would, would be saying that I'm, I'm, I'm no more ready to meet the Messiah, no more ready for God to establish his kingdom, no, no more ready or better prepared than a Gentile. And so that would be a huge admission because the, the Jews have been trained to think of themselves above all the other nations. They, they look down on non-believers. As, as if they were those who had arrived and, and no one else had. But that's, that's right at the point where, where John the baptizer met them. Turn, turn quickly to Luke chapter 3 and, and look with me at verse 7. Luke chapter 3, verse 7. We'll find that, that John preached hellfire and brimstone firm sermons, you could say. He created a fear within the people that, that when the Messiah finally came, when the, when the king ascended to his throne and established his kingdom, that they, they would be on the outside looking in. Luke chapter 3, verse 7, if you're there. Luke, Luke writes that John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And so the, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to, to him. They all came to the, John the Baptist, and he, he calls them to repent, to, to turn away from their rebellious ways, to, and to, to bring forth the fruit of repentance. In other words, prove your faith, humble yourself, and be baptized. It, it was a, a radical call to repentance. But it, but it wasn't John's message. It was God's message to Israel. Luke chapter 3, verse 2 said that the, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. And so John said, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? He preached fire and judgment, and that's, that's what drove the people to want to deal with their sins, because they, they knew their own heart's sinfulness. And so it looked like a national revival as people were confessing their sins and being baptized by him in the Jordan River. Unfortunately, however good it may, may have looked, 
we, we know that it was all superficial because by the time it was all over, you know, the, the hosannas of Palm Sunday, the shouts of crucify him on Thursday, the, the silence of the weekend, the true believers are, are finally gathered there in Jerusalem. And after the ascension of Jesus, the, the final count comes down and there's, there's only 120 of them in the upper room. 120. And so Mark tells us there's this, there's this massive, constant, steady stream of people coming to John in, in the wilderness day after day. And, and I believe it was important that Israel must once more come to the wilderness because they, they were called to a second exodus in preparation for the, a new covenant with God. And it was their willingness to return to the wilderness that signifies the acknowledgement of, of Israel's history as one of, of disobedience and rebellion. And, and yet there was this desire within each one to begin again, to start over. And so they came out to him. In verse 6, Mark tells us that John, he tells us about John. He says, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he, he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, you may have to agree that that may sound like a, a strange diet. But if you're out in the desert Locust and wild honey would be a pretty good way to sustain yourself. You know, just a, a little bit of protein and some natural sugar. And, and on those cold nights, John would be more concerned about staying warm than fashion. So he was clothed with garments made of camel's hair. And in other words, they were woven together to make a, a rough but hairy garment. And around his waist was a, a leather belt holding everything in place. And, and, and this was the attire that would be associated with a prophet. In fact, you could say it was this type of wardrobe that, that was associated with the, the true prophet. You know, we, we meet Elijah, the great prophet Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 1. And verse 8 says this about him. He, he was a man with, with a garment of hair and with a leather belt around his waist. And so like, you know, John's like a, a clone of, of Elijah. And so Elijah, called Elijah the Tishbite, is, is one who set the standard or, or the fashion for a true prophet. prophet. Not, not the wolves that Jesus warned about who, who come in sheep's clothing. This wasn't that. Even, even the false prophets in, in, in the day would, would put on a hairy robe and a leather belt to appear as if they were prophets. But, but John was a prophet. Not only was, was he a prophet, but he was a prophet who came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. In other words, he was a prophet who came with an anointing from God on his head. Luke tells us in his gospel account, chapter 1, verse 15, he, speaking of John the Baptist, will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Earlier we read in Malachi chapter 3 in reference to verse 2 where, where he promised the, the coming of a messenger. But he says a little bit more about that messenger in Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. God says there and through the prophet Malachi, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And this is what Luke meant, that, that John will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. And in fact, Jesus affirmed this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 14, when he says, If you're willing to accept it, meaning if you're willing to accept me and my words, John is the Elijah who was to come. That's Matthew chapter 11, verse 14. Now, if you, if you remember that they wouldn't accept it, they, they couldn't receive it. And so they, they killed both John the Baptist and Jesus. But, but John understood this. He, he knew this prophecy that he, that he would minister in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And so he identified with Elijah. That's why he wore what he wore. That's why he lived the way he lived. He wasn't concerned about being fashionable. He only cared to identify with the prophet. He wanted to speak like a prophet, act like a prophet, and look like a prophet. And so Mark tells us in verse 7 that John was preaching, and this was his message. 
After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. This, this was the sign of a true messenger because he, he points to Christ and never points to himself. In fact, the apostle, apostle John records these words from John the Baptist in John chapter 3, verse 30. John the Baptist says, He must become greater, I must become less. And that, that's really a model for any of us who, uh, uh, any of us as followers of Christ, we, we don't want to model or identify with people. You know, we don't want, we don't want to look like uh, some of the, the super apostles. We want, we want to look like the, the prophets. We want to become more, more like Christ. John, John recognized that even he was unworthy of the lowest position to serve King Jesus. He said, he's so much more powerful, so much more mighty than I am. I'm, I'm, I'm not even up to the level of those who would untie his shoes. That, that's, that's how low I am. And in verse 8, he describes the difference, how he and the Messiah are so infinitely separated. He said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In other words, John says, all, all I can do is immerse you in water. All I can do is, is, is get you really wet, saturating you with water. But, but, but Jesus, Jesus can transform you. He can, he can fill you and empower you with the Holy Spirit. And th this is a baptism that we should seek. It's, a, it's, it's the promise of the Father. And with the baptism in the Holy Spirit comes power for life and service. In fact, Jesus spoke to his disciples about this after his resurrection. And we, we find that in Acts chapter 1, he told his disciples there not, not to leave Jerusalem in verse 4. He says, but, but wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so at this point, Jesus had already gone to the cross. He, he'd already died for their sins. He, he'd rose again and they were saved. They'd experienced the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. They'd been born again. He'd breathed his spirit into them in the upper room, but he tells them even after that to, to wait to wait in Jerusalem till they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them why in verse 8. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And John the Baptist says, I can't do that. I just can't do that. Only Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. It's only King Jesus who gives the Holy Spirit. And with the power of the Holy Spirit comes the giving of spiritual gifts and their, their use in the work of the ministry. And so we find here that Mark begins his historical account of Jesus Christ, announcing the good news of a new king who's a God himself or who, who is God himself bringing a new kingdom. The messenger has come to announce his arrival and, and the rest is history. And we'll find more about that next week. We'll, we'll pick up in verse 9 next week. But let, let's pray together. Lord God, we do thank you so much for this, this wonderful historical testimony of the coming of our Savior. We thank you for the power of your word to, to instill saving faith in our lives. We thank you for our, our baptizer, King Jesus, who, who gives us the, the, the power to live a changed life and to serve you as your witness. I, I pray that there, there may be some even this evening who would say with Peter, you, you are the Christ, you are the King, and that they too would confess their sins, repenting and coming for forgiveness from our, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Tonight as we profess faith in Jesus as King, we, we thank you for leading us to confession, repentance, and salvation in his name. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit the gift of salvation, and the, and the glory of your presence within us. We ask this and pray this through, through Christ in us, the, the hope of glory. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening, and um, we'll catch up with you soon. We'll see you on Sunday. Peace.